Okay, I am so excited to be introducing you all to Dr. Deming with Pacific Marine Mammal Center. Um, hello, Dr. Deming, how are you today? Hello, Giselle, I'm doing great, how are you? I'm uh, very good, I'm very honored to have you here. It's been a pleasure to get to know you a little bit before we do this. And I wanted so much to bring your knowledge, your information, your organization to the forefront of the people who know and follow um, Captain Daves, because we are so like-minded in what it is that we do and the way that we want to help and save and change the world for the betterment of these uh, cetaceans and pinnipeds. And so when I, I, I heard about you specifically through um, your director over there, I said, I would love to have her. So thank you for joining me for the Festival of Wales, the 51st festival. And um, I want to hear first, before we get going, I, um, I want to hear a little bit about how you got started. What was your moment when you said, I want to do this? I want to be um, someone who makes a difference in the world for dolphins, whales, pinnipeds. Yeah, thank you. I'm so excited to talk to everybody that's passionate about marine mammals. I would actually say that my like aha moment was my time on the water growing up with my dad. Um, so I actually grew up in Florida and I was in love with dolphins and manatees. Um, and I think when I was in school, uh, I started learning about some of the health issues these animals were having that were associated with impacts that humans um, were causing on their environment. And I was kind of outraged and I was always kind of, you know, an outspoken child, still an outspoken adult. <laughs> um, and I wanted to make a difference to help these animals that I loved so much and that I've always enjoyed watching and was always so impressed with the fact that they were mammals, but they could live in the water. And, you know, I just had a major connection with seeing them out in the wild. So ever since I can remember, I knew I wanted to be a wildlife marine mammal veterinarian. Um, I didn't really know that that was a job really, but I knew I wanted to help those animals. And I think always being attracted to working with animals in general and wanting to help all animals, I knew veterinary medicine was something I wanted to pursue. Um, and I was really lucky growing up in Florida, being around an area that had marine mammal rehab facilities and marine mammal stranding networks that gave me some exposure when I was an undergrad. Um, so I volunteered for a program and I got to do a lot of necropsies and a lot of um, dolphin and manatee and sea turtle stranding response. And I was hooked. Um, so I went off to vet school at University of Florida and got my veterinary degree. Um, and that university also has a very good aquatic animal medicine program. Wow. So I took advantage of that program. And now I'm actually an adjunct faculty for that program, which is great. So we give the opportunity for some of those Florida folks that aren't lucky enough to have pinnipeds off their coast <laughs> to come over here when they're in vet school to kind of learn what pinniped medicine is about. Oh, that's so, awesome. Now, the, the Pacific Marine Mammal Center is a really special place. Um, it's been here 50 years, is that right, here in Laguna Beach? Yeah, exactly. So the Pacific Marine Mammal Center, we started um, in 1971, and it was a local lifeguard and a science teacher that teaches high school science. And there was a little girl on the beach that saw a harbor seal that looked like it wasn't doing well. And so she approached the lifeguard that was on duty on the beach and said, you save lives, right? And he said, yes, what's going on? And she said, that harbor seal is a life, save that. And that's literally the impetus as, you know, somebody speaking up and advocating for an animal that looks sick on the beach. And 50 years later, here we are wow. Wow. trying to help as much as we can. I love that. Well, um, you've got some slides that I think you can share with us because I'd, I'd love to, for those of you who are local, uh, hopefully you have visited the Pacific Marine Mammal Center. I remember taking my daughter there when she was little and we would watch them get fed and just, it was the coolest thing to see these animals in rehab, to know that if it wasn't for the 
um, presence of PMMC, then they probably would have died uh, without their help. And so that was really exciting and to, to um, be able to be that close to them was fun. And we've just learned so much more about PMMC since then and have so much respect for you guys and, and love the way that we've partnered in the past and moving ahead uh, uh, to the way that we may partner in the future. So tell us a little bit more um, for those who haven't been and for those who aren't local, uh, maybe they wanna come out and visit. And we always tell them, hey, if you're looking for something really cool to do, just drive right up the street to Laguna Beach. It's just a gorgeous drive a few miles up the coast and go visit PMMC. So tell us about um, what you guys do there. Yeah, absolutely. So at the Pacific Marine Mammal Center, we are literally, um, the foundation of what we do here is based off of the community, the local community. So we are a volunteer-based nonprofit organization that provides healthcare for marine mammals in Orange County that are sick or injured. Um, so it's a really unique place that people can come and see these animals during their time in recovery and also kind of learn a little bit more about the marine mammals right off our coast and how we utilize these animals to better understand the health of their environment. So I kind of call sea lions and seals the sponges of the sea because they suck up all kinds of contaminants or toxins that are in the water. And then they can present with health issues that can kind of key us in to ways that we can make the environment a safer place, both for the animals and for us. So um, at the Pacific Marine Mammal Center in Laguna Beach, right on Laguna Beach Canyon Road, um, there's a little red barn and that's the place we've been in for the past almost 50 years in the barn. It started in somebody's backyard. Let me see, you see the presentation view, right? Yes. Great, okay. All right, so that's an, a drone shot of what our hospital looks like right now. You can see we have solar panels. We're very proud of that. We try and practice what we preach. And then we have multiple pools where the animals can be rehabilitated in. And on the inside of the barn is kind of like our emergency ICU area where the more critical patients are, it's temperature controlled. They don't have pool access yet. And um, that is the story I told you earlier. That is the harbor seal that started it all with a lifeguard that was willing to help. I love it. Um, so we love that picture and we love telling that story because I think it just shows how the community really started this and the volunteers that come and provide care for our patients and that educate people that come to our visitor's yard. We have really fabulous docents as well as an education program that kind of outreaches not just to the local community, but virtually all over the US and the world now um, to kind of let people understand the work that we do here and how they can help make the ocean a safer place. Um, so I will say our bread and butter in the hospital at least is pinnipeds. So those are seals and sea lions. So this just gives you an example of some California sea lion baby pups on the left and then elephant seals on the right that we call wieners. And those animals are just being weaned away from nursing on their moms. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of the patients that come through our hospital are very young sea lions or seals. We also get harbor seals, Guadalupe fur seals, northern fur seals, um, and our sea lion patients. And most of the time, they just need a little bit of nutrition. They get pneumonia, secondary abscesses. And when they're hungry, trying to figure out how not to nurse for mom and learn how to fend for themselves, they can be a little precocious and get into trouble sometimes. Um, so we're happy to step in and help them out when they get fishing hooks caught on them or you know, if they eat something that's not making them feel well that makes them present. That's the vast majority of the animals you'll see here in the hospital. Um, but that's not all we do. So we also have a lot of patients um, out in the ocean that are a little bit too big to try and bring them into the hospital for care. And that's where we have to get really creative and figure out how we can kind of bring our show on the road. And when you have this 40,000 pound fin whale that needs a little bit of medical attention, you have to start using your problem solving skills about how you're going to approach that animal safely and provide them with the help that they need. So although you won't see these fin whales in our hospital when you come to visit right. us, um, know that when they're sick or injured out on the water, we do have specialized trained teams that can go out there and try and help them. And then a large component of our research program is also trying to study the population, the health of the population, and better understand um, the things that are impacting them and how we can mitigate those things to make all the marine mammals that are off our coast healthy as possible 
I think we are incredibly lucky. I think everybody watching this knows that we are on the Marine Mammal Highway and we get the coolest cetaceans coming through here. Amazing yeah. baleen whales, really cool toothed whales coming through or toothed dolphins, killer whales, common dolphins, rizzos. I mean, you guys see the coolest stuff on your tours. I'm jealous that I'm stuck in my office in the <laughs> hospital most of the time. Um, but we want to do our best to be able to understand what's going on with their health. Um, and the naturalists and the people that are out there on the waters all the time, like you, are usually our first line of defense for understanding that there's some stuff going wrong. So I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about some of the things that we do here, and then we can go back and forth and ask questions. Sure. Feel free to interrupt me. Okay. And we'll go from there. No, this is great. Thank you. Perfect. So um, my title is um, I'm Vice President of Conservation Medicine and Science at the Pacific Marine Mammal Center. So a conservation veterinarian is kind of a new term, and it's a way a veterinarian can use their skills to kind of understand how to conserve wildlife and help the environment. So although individual patient care is incredibly important, that is the foundation of what we do here at the, Marine, at the Pacific Marine Mammal Center, is to rescue, rehabilitate, and release sick and injured marine mammals in Orange County. Um, we also want to take our message and educate the public, not just K through 12 programs and community outreach and beach cleanups, but also educate people that plan to work in this field in the future. So we can have that ripple effect of giving, you know, biologists, naturalists, veterinarians, veterinary technicians, graduate students, some access to these animals that are typically quite challenging to access and learn about in our hospital, give them some experience and then send them out into the world to make a difference on a larger scale in, at different facilities. So education is one of the pinnacles of our program here um, and our patients are a great platform to get people invested and involved. And then, like I said, research is also um, a growing uh, focus here one of the reasons why I actually started here about two years ago is to help develop our research program. So we can take the messages that our patients are giving us when they check into the hospital, better understand the epidemiology of disease spread, understand contaminants, and also understand things like plastic pollution, fishery gear that is causing issues with these animals and entanglements, and also what we can do to help mitigate change in those things. So inform policymakers and uh, natural resource managers about the issues we're seeing so they can start making some changes to help the patients once we return them back to the ocean. So awesome. we're very, very lucky. We have um, an incredible group of animal care specialists that have been doing this for a really long time. So when patients come in and check into this hospital, we've got that down pat. Um, we're really good at uh, doing the diagnostic tests. So it's basically a really like thorough doctor's appointment the second they walk through the door. These animals get full blood work. We take x-rays of them immediately when they come through the door to see if they've ingested any fishing gear, have any fractures, assess if they have pneumonia. Um, and then once we identify whatever caused them to strand, we come up with individual treatment plans. And so each patient is put on different kinds of medications based off of the issues that we identify from the diagnostic tests we run right when they get here. So I would say my favorite part of the job is getting these individual animals better and out into the ocean again. It's, it's very rewarding. Um, it's, it's immediately positively reinforcing and we're really good at it. So those are the happy things that we kind of hold on to. Um, but we also see the flip side of things, the really sad things. We see a lot of animals suffering um, and a lot of the reasons why patients are coming into our hospital is because of the impacts humans are having on their environment. So mm -hmm. that can be very wearing. And that's where we try and take the messages that our patients are giving us and go beyond that individualized care and start understanding better how we can you know, educate people and do things to make the environment better. So when we're releasing them back into the ocean, hopefully it's a slightly better place for them to be where they're going to be safer and healthier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you've got some excellent equipment there. Yes, we do. We are very spoiled. I, I will say that 
I know I said the community helps us out with our volunteers and our animal care stuff, but we are a nonprofit. So that anesthesia machine you see, our x-ray machine you see, our ultrasound machine, our in-house blood work, our salaries are all supported by donations that the community gives us. We also have an incredible group called the Ocean Club and it's a woman's auxiliary group. And we put them on a mission to start raising money so we can help provide scholarships for students to come here and learn, provide scholarships and, and research funding to do the projects we wanna do and also provide support to help you know, pay these patients medical bills because they never check out with us and take <laughs> care of their bills on their own. So it's pretty incredible um, how much we really have here that has literally been support to us from the community to take care of this amazing resource we have right off our coast. Nice. Yeah. And I think the next part of that is us giving back. Um, so it is hard to get opportunities um, to learn how to be a marine mammal biologist, to learn how to be a marine mammal veterinarian, a marine mammal caretaker. <laughs> Um, so this is actually one of our students that came last summer. Her name is Sammy. She was getting her master's degree looking at California sea lions that had a really high rate of cancer right off our coast the past 40 years. California sea lions have the most cancer of any other wildlife species right off our coast. We'll talk about why in a couple of slides. But Sammy came here to research that, but we don't just let her do her research. We throw her in the deep end. And that's how we are with all of our students. It's all hands on deck get as much experience as you can when you're here, and then you can go back to the computer when you finish gathering all of your data during your time here. Yeah, so this is Ace. He's a Northern elephant seal. He's probably about six months old. And when he came to us, he had this really weird hump in his back. Um, and he was able to use all his flippers. He was ambulating okay and swimming just fine. He was just really skinny and had this weird hump. So we had to take him on a field trip to figure out what was going on with his back because about six weeks after presenting, he went acutely paralyzed in his mm -hmm. hind flippers. So we don't have a CT or an MRI here in house. So we have to take the show on the road and we brought him on a field trip with some of our students that were learning and our veterinary fellow, Dr. Kaylee Brown right there who's sticking her head through the CT um, to get a better idea of what was going on with his spinal cord and why he couldn't walk anymore. And so this is just an image of his MRI. And hopefully you can see that he has, his spinal cord down here should be straight. And there's that little bump that goes up and comes back down. And that caused compression of his spinal cord and made him paralyzed in his hind end. And what we think that probably happened to him is he had some episode of trauma out on the rookery, one of those big adult male elephant seals that can weigh thousands of pounds, potentially trampled him caused some spinal um, trauma and that kind of progressed as he started growing that resulted in him being paralyzed. Right. So being able to work up these patients, being able to put an elephant seal under imaging took almost three and a half hours and oh, wow. under anesthesia because they're diving. But we take that opportunity to teach our students um, and our training veterinarians ways to anesthetize these animals safely and work them up to a point where you can hopefully figure out ways that you can treat them. Right. Yeah, you so, have the benefit of being able to do that with pinnipeds. It's a lot more yeah. difficult to do with cetaceans, you know? Yeah, it absolutely is. And cetaceans are a big challenge as patients in general. I kind of compare um, pinnipeds to pit bulls where they're super tough and they can get through anything. And cetaceans are like the horses, where if it rains a little bit, they colic, and they're just very dramatic and hard to treat. Um, so they're very challenging. And then you run into all the limitations of things like being able to bring them and transport them safely off the beach. Being able to put them through a CT or an MRI is much more stressful. Yeah. And we can't, we don't have the capacity to put cetaceans under anesthesia here at the Pacific Marine Mammal Center, but there are some great facilities that are really advancing that level of care for cetaceans and managed care. Um, but cetaceans are one of my favorite animals to work with. So it can be challenging um, to figure out. Sure. Ways to so to out of them. curiosity, so with a cetacean, because they're voluntary breathers, and for those who are watching, that means they actually are consciously aware of their breathing. So if you, um, if you were to anesthetize, say the word for me, if you were to put them under yeah, anesthetize, anesthetized, yeah. they would stop breathing and die. 
so you can't do right. that. So with this kind of, of um, ability, what are they doing? Are they putting them on some kind of a, of a breathing machine, some kind of, of vent? Yeah, exactly that. So actually all marine mammals um, have this dive reflex, they say, that can kind of keep them from holding their breath when they think they're diving. So even our pinniped patients will go apneic is the expensive word. So we're always ready to intubate them. And then we have a bag that we can breathe for them. And we're trying oh. to purchase a ventilator that will, right now our poor technicians and volunteers have to squeeze the bag, squeeze the bag. 20 times a minute, make sure we're getting enough breaths in them. Right. Um, but we'll, we're hoping to get a ventilator to where we'll have something that will automatically ventilate them. But yeah, those are the challenges. That's why it's so much fun to work with marine mammals. As a vet, they keep you on their your toes. Sure. Um, you always learn something new. It's always a problem solving kind of job, which I really like those kind of challenges. But that's also why for our education component, it's so important to bring veterinarians into our hospital so they can kind of learn from our team and we can also learn from them. And then have more people out in the world that are capable of being able to provide care yeah, for these awesome animals when they need yeah. it. Awesome. So tell us about the conservation focused research. Yeah. And then the last kind of pillar to what we do at the Pacific Marine. Yeah. So the last pillar of what we do at, at the Pacific Marine Mammal Center is research. So like I said, taking care of our patients, getting them treated and out into the ocean is the most important thing. But while they're here, when we take diagnostic samples, like blood samples, we'll run that for their CDC chemistry for their blood work. And then whatever is left over, we'll save and we archive that. And then we can do research with those things. We can do infectious disease testing. We're actually even taking nasal swabs and some developing COVID. Um, so it's that kind of research and those kind of things we can use these animals for in our research program that just kind of piggybacks onto the work we're already doing with the animals while they're in the hospital. So awesome. the key component to conservation focused research is having big questions that will help direct policy and improve the environment, but figuring out ways you can take small bites of those big questions to help continually make progress in understanding your bigger question. And our big question is how the environment interacts with the animals in it and how infectious disease plays a role in that and how people are impacting the environment and that could potentially those waters or the, the people that go swimming in the ocean or go surfing. So we have a lot of research projects that are using marine mammals as what we call sentinel species, which basically means they're the canaries in the coal mine. So let me just go. This slide basically gives you a breakdown of some major research. And we have several research projects under each one of these topics. So I had mentioned earlier that California sea lions right off our coast have the highest rate of cancer of any wildlife species in the world. Like if that's not alarm bells going off in your head, that's, you know, right. you, you need to pay attention to that. So one of the things that we're doing research on, and it was actually something that I, my PhD was focused on. transmitted herpes virus that they spread to each other when they mate. And then the DDT barrels that are off of our coast can cause immune suppression. They can cause hormone dysregulation. And so we think the combination between the DDT exposure and this herpes virus is what's causing wow. all these sea lions to develop cancer. So we have lots of different research projects to try and better understand that. And not just understand it for the sea lions, but be able to utilize these animals to understand how virally induced cancers um, are causing issues in all different kinds of animal species. So even in humans, human papillomavirus can cause cervical cancer. Right. And this urogenital cancer in sea lions mimics that very closely. How so interesting. It, yeah, exactly. We use it to study wow. them as like a model. They're showing up on our doorstep anyway. Unfortunately, a lot of times when they show up, they're in such end stage disease, mm. but the only thing we can offer them is ending their suffering. 
Right. And so another component of what we do here at the Pacific Marine Mammal Center is basically full autopsies or necropsies when they're in animals. It's, and when they're in humans, it's autopsies. In animals, it's called a necropsy. Um, and that allows us to really get into better understanding the illnesses that we're seeing, diagnosing why the animals have stranded. And then we collect hundreds of samples to help better understand all of the things that are impacting these animals. And that's how we do things like test for the DDT in their blubber and get a better understanding of things like what kind of antibiotic resistance we're seeing in the bacteria that they're faced with, with pneumonias and abscesses. And it has a very real human health component to it. So if a sea lion is gonna get a cut in the water and it gets an abscess, a surfer can get that same kind of bacteria in them if they get cut. So they kind of inform us about the things we need to worry about with what's going on out in our ocean. Right. So as far as other things, we're looking at domoic acid intoxication. If you've never heard of that, that's a toxin produced by a marine algae and they can have these big algal blooms and it actually closes down fisheries. So it affects recreational and commercial fisheries. And we're learning that the sea lions are actually better at sampling the environment than some of the researchers and scientists because there's so many sea lions out there, they're eating fish kind of everywhere along our coast. So if there is a bloom, they'll show up on the beaches starting to have seizures before the biologist maybe went to that area to test the water. Mm -hmm. So they're a great indicator species for letting us focus in on where there could be some domoic acid blooms. And actually we're currently in one right now. And one of our patients in-house right na now named Candle presented with acute domoic acid intoxication. And then we found out two days later, the Newport Pier picked up some pseudonychia, which is the marine algae that produces this toxin. So that's exactly the kind of research we want to do where we can be using these marine mammals as indicators for ocean health. And they're bringing the messages from the sea to us to understand what's going on out there so we can better manage our resources. We can tell fishermen maybe don't eat shellfish right now in the area. Right. Um, and we also do a bunch of stuff with things like fisheries interactions. We, we see gillnet entanglements. We see um, we have an entire... Um, large whale disentanglement team I'll talk about in a second. Um, and then not just being reactive and disentangling the animals, but also being proactive and educating people about the ways that they can modify their seafood consumption or support different policy that's potentially being passed in order to decrease the risks that these animals are faced with when they run into fishing gear. Awesome. Um, so that's just a very 30,000 foot view of some yes, of our research yes, we're doing. We right. have over 25, 30 projects. I could talk about it forever. We'll yep. do that a different day. Um, but I will say one of the best things about having a stranding network constantly on our coast is we are monitoring the health of the marine mammals all the time. So we know baseline numbers, how many sea lions we could expect to strand, how many whales show up dead on our beach, how many dolphins strand live on our beach. And when you start seeing anomalous events, like um, this week, we've had 10 sea lions show up dead on our beach, which is very abnormal for us. Why is that happening? So be, having our finger on the pulse constantly of what's going on with the marine mammals off our coast allows us to know when these anomalous events happen. And what the NOAA, who's the regulating agency of marine mammals in the US, um, what they term those things are unusual mortality events. When marine mammals are dying at an unusual rate higher than baseline or expected historical numbers. Currently, we're in several unusual mortality events off of our coast of different species. And because this is the whale, the festival of the whales, we obviously need to focus on that one. Right. So if you guys haven't heard or you're unaware, I'm sure you are, Giselle, but the general public, the gray whales have been having a really hard time. Yeah. Since about 2019, we've had this abnormal number of dead gray whales washing up on the beaches. And so as a part of the stranding network in all of the United States on the West Coast, when a whale does show up on the beach here, we'll perform necropsies on them. We'll try to collect samples to help support the unusual mortality event, event investigation. And the purpose of doing that is to identify why these animals are dying at a higher rate. 
And then that can inform policy and management. This is a constant theme you see. So we can do things to help prevent unusual mortality events like that in the future. Yeah. Sometimes they're preventable. Um, if it has something to do with overfishing of their food, sometimes the problems are a lot more challenging if it's more related to climate change okay. um, or infectious diseases. But it's always good to just know what's going out, on out there. And then we can protect these species that need a little bit extra protection because a lot more of them died in the past few years than they historically should have. So That's for this, awesome. yeah, it's really interesting. It's uh, always unfortunate when these unusual mortality events happen, but we're very happy that we can help contribute to the science and the understanding of what's going on out there and how we can prevent them in the future. So since 2019, and it's still ongoing, although it's slowing down a little bit, we've had 491 gray whales strand from Mexico to Alaska dead. And we are doing investigations trying to figure it out. It's still kind of unknown. It's in the investigation process still, but um, all things are kind of pointing into the direction of decreased food resources with them. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you guys have unfortunately seen how skinny some of these gray whales look. They migrate from the north and go down to Mexico for their birthing and calving time. And then they pass back by Orange County on their way back. And typically they are not feeding very much in their nursing grounds. Right. And so they're relying on their blubber stores to get them through those long migrations, lactating and taking care of their babies, very high energy demand. So by doing research off our coast, by trying to establish a team to do health assessments of whales, by listening to the naturalists and the people that know these animals very well, that can sound the alarm bells that these whales are skinnier than they should be. There's something going on with them out there. What's mm -hmm. happening? Um, so I will say um, that on the right is the numbers. These, these um, slides and numbers were courtesy of NOAA and the investigation that they're doing. So I appreciate Justin Vespecki, who's our regional stranding coordinator, and Justin Greenman. Um, they're in charge of making sure all the marine mammals are well taken care of in, in, in California, all of California. Um, and they've really spearheaded the charge for understanding what's going on with this unusual mortality event. Um, so like I said, um, as you can see, as these years have progressed, the numbers are decreasing. In 2019, it was 216, 2020, 172, and now 2021 was 103. So we like to see that they're doing a little bit better out there mm -hmm. right now. It's encouraging. It's really yeah. encouraging. Yep. And then I will say we do cetacean stranding response and it wouldn't be a presentation from me if I told people if there is a dolphin on the beach, it is a problem. Um, so I know people, the first thing they want to do is get them back into the ocean. So a lot of people want to push the animal back into the water because you see them struggling in the surf, being pushed around by the waves. But if a cetacean has hit the beach, there is something very wrong with them. They're great swimmers. They don't just happen to get washed up on the beach. So typically it's because they're very sick or they're injured and they need medical care. So the best thing to do is to call our stranding number, which is 949-494-3050. And we'll get a team out there. We have a rapid cetacean stranding response team. We've got bags packed. We are ready to roll. We get in our truck. We get on that beach immediately. And then that gives us the opportunity to assess them. And like I said, typically when they show up on the beach, they're very sick. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times they're not good rehabilitation candidates and our mission is to get them returned back to the wild. So we do have to assess on the beach if they are able to be rehabilitated. And then we'll bring them back to the Pacific Marine Mammal Center for what we call stabilization and triage. So we do have the capability to provide short-term care for them in our little red barn in the canyon, where we literally just hold them in one of our pools. We, we can administer IV fluids, we can give them antibiotics, give them a little sedation to take the edge off, um, and also give them some steroids because typically they're chronically stressed. So little steroids help them get over this stressful event a little bit. And then once we get them stabilized and we've identified they're a good rehabilitation candidate, we actually have these dolphin transport boxes, believe it or not. And they're these little like mobile pools, essentially. They're very small and compact, but we can fill them with water. And then we put the dolphin in that and we drive them in the back of our truck, affectionately known as Bertha. 
um, because she's very big and good at her job. And we transport these animals down to SeaWorld and SeaWorld does the long-term care and rehabilitation of them, which is a major investment. Awesome. Yeah. It's a beautiful partnership. It really is. And, um, and I think, I think that speaks to what's required here. It's not ever, you know, one agency or, uh, it's, 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 Although it can be, I guess, but but for the most part, it takes a partnership. You know, it's it's eyes on the water, it's passing it off to you all who can help in some significant way, and then um, pulling in something, someone like SeaWorld, an entity like them. And I think we're we're going to um, talk next about disentanglement, and uh, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a presentation on cetaceans without talking about entanglement and I want to just uh, if, if people are new to us you know entanglement and disentanglement has always been a huge issue for us here at Captain Dave's we have made it a mission of ours since the very early days to educate people on the fact that nearly a thousand dolphins and whales are dying in gear and nets every day around the world, every, I'll say it again, every day around the world. And um, some of these are active nets that are currently being used and the whale swims through it. And some of them are ghost nets that have been used. They got broken for through a storm or abandoned. And now uh, they're floating about and the animal gets entangled in it. So we don't know what percentage is which, but what we do know is that this is a huge problem. And uh, we have seen many uh, over the years come past Dana Point because we are blessed to have 10 different species of dolphins and whales here throughout the year on a regular basis. So we get, like you said, it's the highway. And so we get a lot of these animals and uh, Dave started the first large whale disentanglement team in Orange County. Um, back in 2000, I think it was 2010, and we got the first teams trained, and we worked really well with PMMC, and we would love to, you know, continue to help you all with that. We've got a lot of that great equipment, but doing what you do is so powerful out there, and um, this is, uh, um, tell us about this animal right here. Well, I'll, I'll just say that entanglements are one of I, it's one of the hardest parts of my job. Um, I know we've done that to these animals. It's things we've put in their environment and, you know, they get wrapped up in them just because they're trying to eat. So this is for me, one of the things that's most rewarding. So we have this large whale disentanglement response team, and we're very, we're a very small part of an entire network along the entire West coast of the United States. And it's overseen by NOAA. Um, they have the permit. Everything we do is under their direction. Right. And right. We're, we're all basically on standby. So you guys, Captain Daves has called in the past, I think two or three whales that you guys had encountered that were entangled. So you give us a call. You say that this animal is entangled. Most of the time you're able to hang out with them for a minute, a minute, a couple hours sometimes. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> overnight. Yeah, um, yeah. Our teams yeah. Have, the teams have to get the gear together. They have to get out on the water. That's our little boat blue that you see up there on the screen. Um, there's a lot of specialized equipment. It can be incredibly dangerous. Um, and inevitably the weather doesn't agree with you or it's, it's getting too dark and that can be unsafe. So there's a lot right, of right. associated with disentangling these large whales a lot. But the first step is identifying that they're entangled. And that's where the, having you guys be the boots on the ground, knowing when an animal looks like it's in distress, just knowing their normal behavior, their swimming patterns, because sometimes these entanglements can be really hard to see, especially if they're weighing their flukes down and they're not. Yeah, the oh, yeah. absolutely. You. Yeah. So and sometimes able... it's not until you, you know, launch a drone or you get up really high on a boat and look down and you can see eight to 10 feet in the water and you can see, oh, the reason this animal who would normally be fluking, presenting its flukes uh, when it does a dive, it's kind of just sinking and its behavior is really odd or it's going slower than normal. There's just a lot of things that can send a signal to us that something's not okay. And then we look very carefully and sure enough, you know, there is, um, there's something trailing in the water and that's where a good GoPro on the boat can be helpful. Um, for years, we had an underwater ROV that we could 
pop in, but we found the GoPro was actually just as good and easier to deploy, you know, because sometimes when these animals are distressed, they're not just sitting around waiting for you to come and take a picture of them. And they're, they, and they, they're not happy, you know, with the fact that you're, you're around them. So um, anyway. Um, yeah, it's incredibly challenging and I kind of joke, but it's true. These animals don't check themselves into the hospital or they don't show up. Like it really does take the general public and the people that are out on the water to let us know when these animals need help. Right. Um, that is literally step one. Without that, there's nothing that could be done to help these animals. So right. having these specialized trained teams, having all of our gear ready, having our boat, having ways to try and make it safe for people to disentangle these animals are all great. But unless we know that there's an animal off our coast that needs our help, we can't deploy. We don't, we unfortunately can't go out there on the boat all day looking for them as much as I'd love to. So it's nice that we have this great partnership with whale watching groups like you to be able to let us know. And you guys just have the experience. You know when a whale is wrong. You, you know whale behavior better than I do, that's for sure. So you guys being able to realize something's wrong and put it on the radar of NOAA and then getting us out there to help do our best to help these animals. Yeah. But that's one of the challenges. And I think you and I have this camaraderie and understanding that we don't want to be heroes that disentangle whales every day. That is actually a failure to these animals. I would love yeah. if there was never an entangled whale again, and we would right. never have to deploy our team again. Yeah. So this is where it goes into doing research and better understanding what we can do as a community to not get these animals entangled to begin with. Right. So, and it's not just entanglements. They're getting struck by large cargo ships and boats. There's actually more whales that die of boat strikes than entanglements. So it's knowing how to um, support different kinds of policies, support different kinds of either sustainable seafood or figuring out ways that you can move away from protein sources that put this kind of gear in the water. Right. And developing techniques, like there's something called ropeless crab traps. They're very expensive, but instead of having that long end line that is between the bottom of the ocean and the top of the surface that a whale can get caught up in when it's just swimming by, these new traps that they're trying to develop don't have any end rope on them. And so they're just sunk and then they have GPS systems on them. And then they have a deployable buoy or rope or some kind of inflatable system that will bring them to the surface when they're ready to be collected. Right. And so it's those little small solutions that make a massive amount of difference to these <laughs> animals. And we need to push policymakers and legislation to help subsidize some of the costs associated mm -hmm. with this because that the life of the loss of life of these whales isn't incorporated into that price of your lobster or your crab. Right. Um, so you just have to recognize that decisions you're making every day could potentially be contributing to some of these problems. So supporting um, things that help prevent these issues instead of being reactionary to them right. is really the key to conservation. So that's a, that's a great um, that's a great lead into um, uh, what can I do? And I I tell people that if you're looking for something to do from even the smallest to the largest thing, you can. Um, make a decision if you want to be very aggressive about it, that you're not going to eat fish or crab or anything caught in a pot that could possibly, um, where the equipment that's used to harvest that, that, that animal, um, you can do that. And if that's a little too much for you, then support uh, local U.S. fisheries because they do, of all the fisheries in the world, have the most stringent regulations. And those are the ones that um, at least protect these animals more. And there is more that can be done, but it's a great start. So, you know, consider that. And when you go out to eat or you're buying your food, um, look and see where it's caught. And if it doesn't say U.S., then then put it back and try to support, you know, the U.S. fisheries because our uh, those are those are going to be at least somewhat safer for these uh, for these animals. Helping people understand what they can do is a great first step in prevention, and then um, supporting, you know. Um, entities like yours not for profit so let's kind of um talk really quick about 
Um, how can someone support an organization like PMMC? What can they do? How can they get involved? What, what would that look like? Yeah, there's all kinds of ways people can help. Um, so it kind of depends on your timing and, you know, where your interest lies. I always encourage people to pursue their interests. So I really like hands-on working with animals. If I had to do anything with PMMC personally, I would want to be an animal care volunteer. Um, those are the people that come into our hospital and do the day-to-day -day caretaking, feeding, cleaning, administration of medications um, to our patients in hospital. Um, so that's always an option. Do I um, need experience to do that? Or are you going to train me how to do everything? No, we train, we train. So, you know, nobody really comes out the gate with experience and working with wild pinnipeds. You're not supposed to be approaching, <laughs> approaching them, you know, so we I, have the opportunity. We have a great crew. We have people that have been volunteers for us for over 30 years. Uh, so that kind of institutional knowledge and being able to pass that down to generations is really at the cornerstone of what we do. So don't feel like you have to, you know, have a ton of experience to come here. It's actually easier to train the people that don't know anything. Right. And, try and break some bad habits. Yes. Um, and but, then there's um, support, right? I can give, I can go to your website and yeah. I can give, we'll put the website in the chat as well. Uh, that's another way they can help. Um, but I think the reason that you have so many volunteers that are um, um, committed is because they develop, uh, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a great bond there working together to help these animals, but they also develop relationships. And so I wanted to kind of use that to segue into uh, the story that I'd love to hear you tell about Loki. Oh, my favorite story about Loki. Okay. So um, if you are a regular of Dana Point Marina, you have the opportunity to see Loki because he is a local star. So this is a picture of Loki on the left. He's a California sea lion, subadult male that presented with gill net entangled around his net. So gill net is a meshing of net made of monofilament um, and sea lions go where the food is and fishermen go where the food is. So inevitably there's interactions between the two. And if a sea lion hits these curtains of nets that are in the water and get their head through it, they end up twisting around and they get it entangled. Sometimes like this animal, multiple loops. So we've had, there's some people who are living my dream paddleboarding in Dana Point every morning. And they'll give us a call and let us know this animal is here entangled in fishing gear. Can you come help him? And the problem with these entangled animals, similar to the whales, is sometimes they're, unless the entanglement has progressed, which in this picture it has progressed, obviously, um, they're pretty healthy animals. They're in good body condition, they were out there eating, and then they ran into this net, which is making them have a health issue. So they're a lot harder to capture and rescue than our sick pups that are typically sitting on the beach. These animals frequent marinas when they're entangled or on buoys. It's much harder to do rescues when they're on a dock. You can imagine trying to get a 300, 400 pound sea lion in a net and not fall into the water with him is challenging. Um, so we have developed um, a pinniped disentanglement team. So just in the past two years, we've developed capacity to go out there and use something called remote sedation. So people probably recognize it's a fancy word for dart guns. We don't like to use the word gun. I call them projectiles or medicine delivery devices. So it doesn't sound negative. But this allows us to deploy a sedative through a syringe using this projectile or this gun that projects the sedative to them. And then they'll fall asleep. Um, sometimes they can go into the water and fall asleep and that gets a little bit dangerous. So these rescues are by no means a safe option, but sometimes when these animals have life-threatening injuries and they're suffering as incredibly as they are, we have to weigh those risks and benefits. And that's where having some veterinary experience and being able to look at this picture of Loki and say, the, the depth of that laceration associated with that neck cutting through or the neck cutting through his muscle is now impacting potentially his trachea or larynx, right. so his windpipe. Right. And in his case, actually, it went just behind the tongue and cut a hole through his neck and you could reach into the back of his mouth. Wow. Um, so he had a horrible entanglement. In order for us to deploy remote sedation, there's human safety concerns we have to worry about when we're projecting a dart um, right. with sedatives in it. 
Um, and there's animal safety that we need to worry about. So it takes a lot of planning. We usually have five to six boats on the water. We have Harbor Patrol helping us for safety and to keep people away. We kind of do it very quietly in the background when nobody really knows very early in the morning. So, you know, we are not running into having a lot of people right. around that we need to move and clear out of the area. Um, but we get permission from NOAA to do all of this stuff and we do it under their permits with their guidance and they help us decide risk outweighs the benefit of attempting to remotely sedate these animals. So Loki was like literally the poster child. He was our first remote station at PMMC as a team. And he was sitting next to, I don't know if you were the wind and sea is those first row of boats. Yep. I don't know if the boat owners are watching right now, but the people that own the boat second chance, which is right next to Skylar, like it was just ironic. He was on that finger dock right there, right next to the boat called second chance. So <laughs> we felt like that was a sign and these animals right. don't show up for their doctor's appointments. So when we get 20, 30 people out there, five boats on the water to try and rescue them, just the fact that they're even in the marina makes it a good thing. But the fact that he was isolated away from other animals, so we're not risking deploying that dart into the wrong non-target animal, right. he was in a great position. So he really, it was a textbook, almost perfect darting. And we'll give you a video where you, you're- um, Yeah, we'll put the watching. link in the chat, yeah. Yeah, can kind of see how it went from the start to the finish of this rescue. And we were able to deploy the dart. He fell asleep on the dock, but ended up rolling into the water. And he was floating on the surface. Our amazing boat blue, you'll see in the video, and our rescue team led by Wendy Leeds and Bill Lackey, who is a retired firefighter who makes sure we're safe out there. He's our safety officer when we're doing um, things like this. Scooped him up in the net, got him into our rescue boat, and then he was brought back to the Pacific Marine Mammal Center. And I, like I said, his injuries were hor horrific. You can see this radiograph on the right-hand side. Significantly, yeah. that line had cut all the way up to the bottom of his skull from the bottom of his neck, that big of a defect associated with it. So he was really at the point of not being able to survive. Um, and we called in sometimes, you know, I'm a veterinarian. I try and do the best that I can, but I also know my limitations. And this kind of injury requires significant surgical intervention. So that's when we call people that are smarter than me or better than me at certain things, and they can come in and do that surgery. So we called in a small animal vet named Dr. Tam. She is the best, and she is always willing to help us and the Marine Mammal Care Center up in LA to help fix these kind of terrible entanglements. So she did almost a three-hour surgery, put so much suture into his neck. There was no way it was going to open up. And for me, I find it ironic that the monofilament that cuts through their neck is also the same type of suture we use to close up that defect. Um, so Loki was amazing. We were able to surgically fix this and then we ended up releasing him. And unlike a lot of our patients, we've seen Loki a lot. So he is a regular of Dana Point Marina. He had two different entanglements, one kind of near his jaw and one a little bit lower down. So if you guys keep an eye out for him, he's still, the, the one that we really needed to fix was the higher one that was cutting into his mouth. And that can have a lot of tension, especially with as much as they can move their neck. So we wanted to make sure that primary closure stayed closed. And this secondary or the second laceration was fairly superficial. It didn't interact with any of his vital structures underlying it. So we let that heal with something we call second intention, which is an expensive word for leaving it alone and letting it heal on its own. <laughs> got it. So you'll see him out there. He's got a scar just under his chin. He's got a bad haircut from our shave job. That'll grow back this year. That's um, great. And then and when did you, little... you... Go ahead. I was going to say, when did you release him back into uh, the ocean? I want to say like May or June of 2021. Okay. Um, so he's been out there for seven, eight, nine months ish, and he is fat and happy. The lot, the most recent time we had, we didn't see him for about three months. And then we got a picture of some, an animal that somebody thought was entangled because you can still see the right. scar tissue. Right. Right. Um, and they sent it to us. He has, you can probably see in this picture, these gorgeous long whiskers for an adult male sea lion. So I recommend oh, yeah. those whiskers from anywhere. 
Um, and when they sent us a picture, we were like, I can't believe that's Loki. He probably gained close to a hundred pounds. <laughs> fat and happy, living his best life in Danish. That's so <laughs> cool. Well, I think I, I mentioned to you that um, a couple of weeks ago, um, Vicki uh, Patterson did a stand up for trash um, uh, event over at the Ocean Institute. And she had Amanda from PMMC there talking about entanglements with fishing lure and, um, you know, the lines that wrap around. And sometimes it's gillnet, you know, which can in some parts of the world be up to 30 miles wide, which is insane. But here in the United States, they are limited to being just, just one mile. And that's crazy. But uh, and sometimes it's just a recreational fishing line, you know, that gets discarded and then the animal is maybe grabs a fish at the end of a, of a fisherman's line. He's pulling it in and then the, the animal gets hooked and then the line wraps and maybe it wraps around their flipper or something. And, and so they get themselves all tangled up. But um, uh, she was doing a presentation and she was talking about Loki and like right on cue, Loki showed up right off the dock at the Ocean Institute to sort of wave hello. And, and uh, it was just the coolest thing. So, um, you know, sometimes we've had that happen with a whale after a disentanglement where it will um, be freed and it will turn around. We've had that happen at least twice. I can think of off the top of my head um, where it will turn around and come back and look at the people on the boat. And I'm sure, you know, the team, um, you know, having probably also been there has had that same kind of an experience. So it's, it's you'll never know um, what that connection is, but it's really special. If he's well, anything, he's reliable. And he, yeah. I think, likes the camera and the attention because he showed up when we were doing a film shoot about ocean plastic and trash. And oh, we wow. talked about his case in one of the interviews. But, we, you know, we can't guarantee this one day he's going to show up for <laughs> Marina. So I think he's kind of a hand. Yeah, probably. Probably. Um, well, we'll keep an eye out for him this weekend. For his he is. Yeah, and I'm hoping he shows up. For the Festival of Wales this weekend, the 51st Festival of Wales. Well, Dr. Deming, thank you so much for taking the time and to share with us your passion and how you're changing the world of Wales is really inspiring. So thank you. I love seeing um, people like you out in the field just making such a difference. So thank you for all that you do. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Giselle. And thank you guys and Captain Dave for all you guys do for us letting us know when animals need help and just... you're welcome it's our pleasure thank you for responding okay take care bye-bye